thank you for being here. It's really nice to see everyone here on, on a nice Sunday afternoon. <laughs> so uh, to introduce myself, I am Rance Mock. I am the program director at Integrate Art Society. Um, and uh, I, uh, a little intro about myself. My family is from Hong Kong. And um, I have, in 1995, I moved over here, um, first onto Musqueam territory, and um, spent a little bit of time on Algonquin territory, and now eventually on the Kwangan territory for the last eight years. Um, and with uh, this project, uh, it's really about understanding the way that we here in Victoria, the way we talk about art, the way we share art, um, and the implications of all that means. You know, what what are the structures that are behind that, and and is there a need to change it? Um, what is actually possible beyond what we have now? Um, so this is a new project for Integrate. In previous years, uh, we've really been focused on the Arts Festival, which is about showcasing art, showcasing local art. But um, in recent years, we've, we realized that we needed to focus more on being relevant to the community that we serve. Um, and it means having important conversations like this. So this project, Feedback Feed Forward, consists of this discussion. Um, and then there's going to be one on September 14th. Uh, and then we also have um, a survey over there. If, if any of you feel like you can contribute, we would li really love to know um, how you feel around arts, arts writing, criticism, and community. And that kind of helps us feed into a final report that we can then share with art organizations, the public, and funders. Um, and so we want to say that this project isn't possible without primary colors. So we're very lucky to have Franz Trepanier and Chris Creighton Kelly here with us. Um, it is really through their support that this is possible. You know, they talked us through this project, you know, what it, what it should be. They've shared a lot of their knowledge and care with us. So thank you very much. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and also uh, we do have funding from the CRD and from uh, Canadian Heritage, and we have some support from local businesses with uh, Metropole, Habit, uh, Market on Yates, Open Space, MediaNet, uh, Island Blue, um, and Cultured Kombucha. Um, so some housekeeping items, uh, you'll see Marina has two uh, cameras set up. So we do have a media release form out front. If you haven't signed it, please make sure you do. And also, if you're not comfortable with the camera, um, we have little stickers. Um, that you can put on or um, you can let us know. Um, I, I'm here, you can find me. Regan is over there, she's waving. Camille is sitting there. Uh, and then Selena is here in the back. Um, we're really here to help you with anything that you need. Um, washrooms, there's two over here and then there's two in the next room over there. If, if you find that the conversation um, is a little bit much for you and you do need time away, uh, please feel free to leave the circle and and take some time for yourself either outside or there is a room next door as well. And um, please come find us so that we can also help you as well. Uh, and of course, if you can, turn off your cell phones or at least turn it to silent. Um, it's not easy for our speakers here to share their thoughts and, um, and we will be inviting you to also join the conversation. So if you do choose to share, it's, that's also um, not easy as well. So we ask everyone in the circle to really listen deeply um, maybe give space to those who might have this not who don't have the same privileges as you um, act from a place of, of care be aware of your own impact um, help us make this a safe space um, and we also do have an accessibility and safer spaces statement um, that Selena has on hand so if you want to take a look please feel free the final thing is um, our aim is to really frame this project with within um, the five R's and the five R's are reciprocity relationality, respect, responsibility, and relevance. And these terms come from the work of Linda Tuhiwai Smith and Sean Wilson and other indigenous scholars, and they come to integrate through France and Chris. Um, so we ask you to think about these terms as well as we proceed. And uh, now I'm gonna turn it over to Kim, who's our facilitator. Kim, if you wanna introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay, hello, is this working? Yes, okay, hi. Um, welcome, thank you so much for coming on a sunny Sunday afternoon at the end of the summer and sharing your time with us. Um, my name is Kim Dillon and I think, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the facilitator here today, so I'm sort of 
chairing the conversation, guiding, guiding the flow of conversation. I think I'll sort of introduce myself um, in a moment, because I think before we do anything, um, I want to address the land acknowledgement. And I am going to read this because I just want to make sure I sort of get my thoughts right as I had them written down. From here on, I'll probably speak a lot more freely as we go. Um, so we're situated on traditional and unceded Coast Salish territories, specifically on the, of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples, currently known as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, as well as the Wasanich peoples. Having said this, our acknowledgement of the land does not neglect that Integrate is continuing to receive privileges both individually and as an organization due to the effects of historic and ongoing colonialism. We're grateful that we continue to learn from those whose traditional territories we're currently on, and acknowledging the land also means acknowledging the truth of colonialism and its impacts, including disease, genocide, and a lack of rights to freedom and sovereignty. Especially given what we're discussing here today, it's important to consider land acknowledgement as not just words, not just lip service, but thoughtful action, reflection, and discussion, which we're hoping you all share with us. Um, and I think that much of what we discuss here will begin to explore this, in particular ideas of contemplating land and the relationship of land to language and the importance of how such ideas are framed. Um, and I think we'll, we'll get into a lot of ideas that a land acknowledgement touches on as we go through the course of the conversation. So the way we've envisaged that the structure of this will take place is that uh, myself and the three speakers here um, will sort of have a, a facilitated conversation about ideas of art, writing about art, um, discussing art, sharing it, communicating it with the public, ideas of criticality, ideas of accessibility. Um, and we'll, we'll sort of share that for about an hour. And then at that point, we're hoping that we'll turn some of the questions over to you. Uh, and the discussion can continue in a, in a further shared format where we're not sort of a panel here presenting our ideas and our knowledge and our experience solely, but it's very much of a sort of shared two-way conversation between ourselves and you. Um, and as Rent said, then there is also um, the survey. If anyone wants to sort of give your ideas but doesn't want to um, verbally do so, then, then that's there available for you. Okay, so... So Integrate contacted me back in February um, with, this, with this project and asked if I would facilitate it. And I'm an art critic and an art historian. And the, the initial topic was decolonizing art criticism. And Integrate had been running a festival for several years. And some of the dancers who were taking part in the festival in particular had said it would be really useful to have some sort of documentation, some sort of way that they could use the festival to move forward with their practices. And if there wasn't documentation, then they were struggling to do so. And so Integrate at that point thought, OK, let's, let's create this documentation. Um, let's create an art magazine. But, and then at that point, and this was in a conversation I was in, so I might be relaying it slightly inaccurately, but that's also part of the theme of the day. Um, the Integrate, Rance, and Reagan had some conversations with Open Space, who said, well, do you really want to do that? Do we really need another art magazine oh, with primary colors? <laughs> Do you, do you really need, okay, so there you go. <laughs> do you really need another art magazine to simply replicate the, the forms and the ways of talking about art that we already have, or do we need something different? And that was the point at which they came to me and said, shall we facilitate this conversation? Shall we invite artists and makers and writers together who are coming from different um, cultural backgrounds, um, whether they be indigenous or people of color, uh, whether they be born here in Canada, or whether they be born elsewhere and have emigrated here as a child or as a youth. Um, and, and should we have a conversation about if, if there wasn't this one model that we were kind of looking at of, of the art magazine, what else might be possible? And so that's the foundation on which we're hoping the conversation will go forward today. We're not looking to come um, at the end of it with concrete solutions and, a, and an agenda and a manifesto for what we'll be doing, but kind of discussing freely what, what might be possible if the um, formats that we currently know weren't existing and, and weren't the sort of dominant ones. And so, with that preamble, um, I think I shall introduce myself to you a little bit more, and then I'll let the speakers introduce themselves, and then we'll get rolling. Oh, and I want to, before we introduce ourselves, just reiterate that we're all kind of here as individuals. Um, everyone's kind of speaking from a position of honesty and openness of their own experience. Um, I, 
I can't really claim to be representative of anyone other than myself, and I feel that's probably the same for the other panelists here. Mm -hmm. um, so while we all may belong to uh, different communities um, at different points in our lives or all at the same point in our lives, um, we're, we're kind of here as individuals sharing experiences and hope that you join us in that pursuit. So um, I think I'll introduce myself and then I'll go to Sally on my left and then Lindsay and Serena. So um, my name is Kim Dillon. I'm an art historian, an art critic, and a writer. And uh, I'm, I'm Punjabi and English. Uh, I was born in England and I grew up in the Okanagan and then I've spent most of my working career in London, England until I moved back here um, two years ago, which was pretty much a direct result of Brexit. So I am kind of have a lot of privilege with mobility um, that's pretty much a result of the British Empire and colonialism. And I ping-pong between London and Canada for the brunt of my life and my father before me between India and England, and uh, that's maybe something that will come up later. Um, <laughs> and and I, I make my practice as a social art historian. I'm really interested in the ideas of society and politics and art as a catalyst for dialogue and for change. Um, and I've written internationally for art magazines for the last 15 years. And I also teach um, in, I teach art theory and art history in art schools, um, currently at the University of Victoria, as well as at Emily Carr and at um, art colleges in the UK. And that's, yeah, I think that's probably as much as you need to know about me at the moment. I'm sure the rest will kind of come out in preambles to questions. Oh, and my pronouns are she and her. Okay, Sally? Thanks, Kim. Uh, my name is Sally Lin, and I'm a poet, writer, artist, um, doing various kinds, depending. I have a very shifting mood in terms of what I like to do in terms of art, and so it's always hard for me to say what I'm, what I'm focusing on. But um, I am Chinese-Canadian. I came to um, Canada with my family when I was quite young. So we, I mostly grew up in Treaty 6 and 7 territory in what is now we call Alberta and then have kind of bopped around Canada quite a bit. Um, I also work in public health and health research, and so that's what I mostly do, but um, art has been a part of my life as long as I can remember, and actually it's been coming to this city that we call Victoria almost three years ago that I've been able to really focus on it in a more intentional way. Uh, and part of that, interestingly, is because it is such a white city <laughs> that it's really got me thinking about myself and my privileges and my position to everything in a way that I think living in the other cities and other places in Canada, I, I didn't uh, have to or, or wasn't as present. And so uh, I'm really excited to be here. This is a conversation that I would, I've had many times with many different people and, and each time I've learned a lot from it. And so I'm really excited to be here and have this conversation. Thank you. Lindsay? My English name is Lindsay Delarond. I'm a Ganyakahaga woman, originally from Gahnawage, which is in the province of Quebec. That's where I was born and raised for 20 years of my life um, and moved to the West Coast in 2004, I think, 2004. Um, and it's been a whole new journey from, from then on. So it's been about 15 years now since I left my community. And, um, you know, my whole focus and, and passion for leaving my community was to become an artist. Um, it was really a, a, a vision, um, a dream that I had uh, as a young person and I've never really um, left that path in, in any capacity. Um, it's really been a way for me to understand myself um, I've used art really to, to heal my spirit, I would say, primarily. And um, I always had this idea of what an artist was, you know, and I, I, I was influenced from my uncle, uh, Ryan Rice, who is a, a curator in Canada, a Mohawk curator in Canada, and uh, I had seen him travel a lot growing up as a, as a young uh, girl, I would. He would go all over the place. My grandmother would say, 
oh, he's gone to Turkey now, and now he's in Israel, and he's in all these places in the world. And that was really um, the roots, I think, and the inspiration of wanting to be a maker. And, um, you know, he had, he had his room at my grandmother's house, and I, and I spent a lot of time at my grandmother's house, and he had all these art books. And I would go in there and I would read all of his art books and look at all of the First Nations art. And Rebecca Belmore, she was very inspirational to me as, as a young person. I didn't later realize I would get more into performance, but um, definitely that pathway of, of indigenous arts was, was my goal and focus. And so I did everything um, that in my reality, was going to contribute to me to be a successful artist. And so I use education um, to be able to help mold and shape that for me. And um, Western education, you know, the Western institution, I don't have a lot of experience with like an indigenous mentor um, in, in, in traditional arts, I would say, but um, very institutionalized. Really from a young age, I started art school when I was 16 years old in Montreal. And it was right from there, I remember going into my first drawing class and uh, we had a nude model. And it was just like this realization of like, wow, okay, here we go. Now I'm going to be an artist and this is what we do. Um, so. Like, I mean, there's a, there's a big story behind how I got to where I am today, and I'm grateful to be an artist. It's given me life, it's been able to um, connect me with others, and um, it's been able to give me um, some reciprocity of giving and taking. And, and now I um, live here on the Kongan territory and I work at the University of Victoria and I have a 12 year old daughter and I have a 10 month old baby and I have a partner from a house it and so this is home for me. This is where I live and choose to work and put my energy and emotions and um, you know to contribute to the, the larger arts community in Victoria and so I'm I'm grateful that I have the opportunity and the privilege to be able to uh, contribute to that legacy, you know, and it, it wasn't an easy path for me to get to where I am today. I've had to go through a lot of different um, challenges, and so I'm glad to sit in circle with all of you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Serena? Yeah. Thanks, Kim. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Serena Lucas Bandar. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a writer, storyteller, artist, workshop facilitator. Um, I've been living on the Kwangan and Wasanic territories for the past eight years, and I grew up on Malahat and Couch and Lands, uh, now known as Shawnigan Lake. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on my father's side, um, I am uh, from the Punjab uh, in India, similar to Kim. Uh, and on my mother's side, uh, I am more uh, further back uh, from Wales, Ireland, and a few other places in the British Isles. Um, yeah, I was really just delighted to be invited to this uh, event. Um, I'm fairly new to my uh, creative practice, and uh, I did do a degree at uh, the University of Victoria in their creative writing program, and uh, since then I've had some success, um, uh, and I've uh, worked with uh, the Malhout Review um, and Room Magazine recently, um, and uh, I also uh, work, uh, my day job is with the uh, Anti-Violence Project at UVic. Um, and I also do youth programming with Sandwich Parks and Rec and uh, the Unitarian Church of Victoria. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so thank you all for being here. All right, so we're gonna start by talking about our criticism because that's, that was my original brief and that's what brought us here. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I imagine everyone kind of sitting here is either an artist or a maker or a viewer of art in some respect, because um, why else would you be here on a sunny Sunday afternoon? Um, and you know, as someone who's, who's been an art critic and an art writer for, for some years, my understanding of it is very much in this kind of mechanism of the art world, which is a pretty close, small world um, as it exists. And you know, so you have the artist in their studio making their work, and occasionally there's an exhibition at which point the work is taken from the studio and placed in a public format where people can view it. Mm -hmm. And 
Uh, but you know, that's, that happens for a brief moment in time. It's maybe a couple weeks, maybe it's a couple months, depending on the size of the institution. And the art critic kind of comes in at that point, and, and there's a role of sort of assessment of the work. There's a role of writing about it to, uh, to sort of make it have some permanence beyond that ephemeral moment of the exhibition. Um, and there's also that sort of weight of judgment, um, which is inherent there within the title. And, and then maybe, you know, maybe the critic has some sway, maybe they're writing for a large international publication, and maybe it's having some sway on uh, collectors and, and acquisitions committees at museums, their own big institution with their own colonial weight. And so maybe the work gets collected by the institution and then it has a, a permanent role in that institution and it's shown you know, for pu future exhibitions. Um, and and maybe, maybe it's not shown, maybe it's not written about, maybe it sort of just um, dissipates off into ether and is part of the artist's practice. And so my, my understanding of, of criticism is, is to be something that sort of acts somewhat as um, a filter and a mediator. Um, in my early work, I was taking that assessment role when I really didn't know what I was saying or what I was assessing, but I was kind of replicating stuff that I had seen written without sort of thinking it through. Um, and, and I've been reflecting as well that criticism probably has a pretty different role here in Canada. I'm, I, you know, I grew up here in BC, but I've lived and worked in London and England for the last 15 years. So London's a pretty densely populated area with hundreds of galleries and thousands of artists. And the critic is kind of a filter there where they're sort of, you know, picking out things that no one could possibly see everything of. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of making this judgment and acting as a filter. Whereas here, Canada is pretty geographically large and pretty densely populated, or pretty pretty sparsely populated. And so maybe the critic has a different role, where they're kind of um, a translator and and communicating to someone in another geographic location something that's happened, which they may not physically able to see themselves. Mm. Um, and so those are kind of my my sort of understandings of criticism. And obviously, it sort of goes without saying that this is all kind of part and parcel of an art world that's based on a capitalist infrastructure, right? But if, if that's kind of, um, you know, my kind of understanding of art criticism, I wanted to first turn to you, Lindsay, and ask if, if criticism, if art criticism is even relevant to your practice, mm -hmm. um, and if so, how? And, and what's your relationship to art criticism as an artist? Mm -hmm. Well, when I had first met with Kim, we talked, um, about what you had just said, what art criticism serves in your experience. Um, and I didn't even know any of that, so I was thankful. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's what art criticism is for, and that's sort of the conventional process of, um, you know, getting into a collections and it has its own life, and um, the position of an art critic uh, contributes to that. And so my own personal relationship with, with art criticism um, you know, it's. Uh, I feel like it's very. Uh, I, I could really take it in a very personal way. You know, I, I feel like there's two words. There's art, and then there's criticism. And I think I have to unpack that word a little bit prior to even get into those two words coming together. And I think about. Um, you know, criticism in terms of my understanding and personal experience with being criticized. Um, you know, with, with Ganawage and where I, I, I was raised and I was born over there, you know, there's um, ways in which colonization has impacted the way that we relate to one another as Ngwehunwe people, as the original people. And because of some of the uh, frag, frag, fragmented relationships, you know, when the missionaries started to come to our community and bring... Uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Church and, you know, that created a, a huge um, wound and a, and a severing of our cultural ways and understanding our governance structures, uh, female roles, identities, male roles and identities, um, our whole system um, dismantled from that disruption. And so, you know, in the way that Mohawk people have come to live their everyday lives and the normal language, um, there's a lot of lateral violence in my community. And I feel that was, um, and I'm only talking about this because criticism triggers that in me. 
when mm -hmm. I hear the word criticism, like, whoa, okay, now I'm back living on the reserve for a minute. Mm -hmm. And so I need to unpack this stuff prior to even getting to some sort of intellectual conversation mm -hmm. because that's the way that I work. I work, you know, my emotions are, are primary. That's how I'm going to understand if I'm safe or not or, you know, um, what narrative needs to emerge. And so it, it's a sensitive subject, I feel like, as an Indigenous person, as an Indigenous woman, criticism. Um, and so from that type of lateral violence and that languaging, um, you know, and I know it's all underlying fear and impacts of colonization and, um, you know, that system of the elected, elected council in contrast to our traditional government really played a huge role in the trust amongst the community. So by the time I left Ganawage, I had already understood um, that I could not self-actualize because of criticism, because of uh, judgment and the way that um, lateral violence was going through our communities and still lives to this day. And that's just one little narrative. So, uh, you know, and there's a lot of beautiful things about my community as well. So. Um, try not to get trapped in that negative thinking. And I'm only starting there because it spirals into, you know, first understanding that in coming over here, you know, art criticism and criticism definitely played a different role here on the West Coast. And I would say that um, moving away from more of that emotional trigger of what critique means, um, in art school, you're, you're, you're trained to learn how to critique or get critiqued um, or people not really knowing how to critique. It's such this weird moment in art school when you're trained in the institution, you know, and everybody has that moment to, to um, have an opportunity to hear how people talk about your work and what they see. And um, it was never helpful, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, stop asking me questions like that. It's, it doesn't even matter. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, I think relevancy in terms of the institution, sometimes I think it needs to, you know, definitely find new pathways mm -hmm. of learning how to speak about art and really digging deep. And, you know, I come from a therapist background, so mm -hmm. it's just the surface. My artwork is just the surface of, like, uh, you know, so much uh, healing mm -hmm. behind it. And I would say in most recent art criticism has served a very positive place in my practice, especially with my Indigenous artists in residence because we had people that wrote for Monday Magazine and different types of magazines that were very um, passionate about the Indigenous theater that we were doing at the Belfry. And so we needed those allies, we needed those people that were in the positions of being able to write about what we were doing um, that was a resurgence because Indigenous theatre has been pushing hard for decades mm -hmm. now. And on the Kwangan territory in particular, in the last two years, it was a, a rebirthing or a revisioning of Indigenous theatre here in Victoria. And so when people had gravitated towards knowing about what we were doing um, with the artists in residency and the performative community here in Victoria, um, those articles mattered in, in, the, in the magazines. They, they, they mattered in the way that we're, they were speaking about the work and the, and, and one thing that I would say and what made, made it a positive experience for me, it was relational. So they would sit with me and talk with me, and um, they weren't an outsider looking in. Mm -hmm. They were spending time with me and understanding what our process was and how we emerged and how did we come together and how were we able as a group to execute these showcases that, that um, were so successful in our communities. And so I would say that when people take that power of writing something down, I, I, I would really surely hope that they're connected to the people that they're writing mm -hmm. about and that they're not an outside person with no connection or a relationship. And so criticism could both mean positive and it could mean negative. Um, but in terms of this conversa conversation, I would say that in terms of my experience, it, it was useful because we needed to get people into those seats. Mm -hmm. We needed people to come see what we were doing and, and 
we needed to um, expand in terms of um, alternative populations that mm -hmm. we might have, you know, yeah. So thank that's you. my yeah. experience. No, thank you. I mean, there's, mm. there's loads of, loads, loads more to talk about within there. Mm. Serena or Sally, do either of you want to respond either to what Lindsay said or to whether our criticism has a relevance to you as a practitioner? Yeah. Serena? Um, yeah, like I just, I pick up what you just were saying about um, relationships, I think, and, you know, what is the relationship, I guess, between a critic and the artist and the art itself. Um, uh, the criticism that I've, uh, you know, appreciated and leaned to more towards in my own arts practice has been always the one that's more based in my own community, um, that's uh, based in, uh, you know, known relationships that uh, have values outside of just trying to talk about the art itself. I think, you know, um, there is a, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but I think there is a responsibility on the part of critics to, you know, do that relationship building and that meaningful relationship building that doesn't just exist for the sole purpose of, you know, promotion. I mean, promotion is an important part of it and evaluation is really important, but, um, you know, I think about um, the stuff that's been written about my writing and I, you know, all the stuff that I really have enjoyed the most and really, thought connected with my writing the most has been stuff that um, has been from my own communities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sally, did you want to respond? Yeah, I think um, kind of earlier on you were saying if you appreciated when Kim kind of broke down, just like mm -hmm. you did now, what our criticism was. And I think for me, not having gone through any you know, institutionalized formal art training, mm -hmm. I, it did feel really opaque and I didn't really know what it looked like, but I knew that it was potentially dangerous and mm -hmm. scary. I just had that feeling, mm -hmm. that intuitive feeling that the criticism could hurt me and could kill the practice before it was even born. And so I think for most of my childhood and young adulthood, just really kind of pushing away from it and pushing away from the, the you know, definitely perceived and actual capitalistic ways of art making and just keeping it really, really private and only really, like I was saying, in the last three years or so, kind of, you know, venturing out, opening the door crack to, to see what it was like and see if it was safe, partially because I've been meeting people like yourselves and, and others at open space, meeting people that I'm like, okay, these are people I feel comfortable sharing a little bit of this and a little bit of that and feeling like there could be a community where instead of immediately feeling like they would just break me down, criticism that attacks, that it could be criticism that actually pushes me mm -hmm. as an mm -hmm. artist, as a person, just to really, you know, events like this push me. Like I'm like saying to, I think, multiple, I don't really like talking about myself or my art in front of people because it feels really foreign because I'm scared that somebody will stand up and say, like, your art sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, why, why are you here? I saw your poem and it's really mm -hmm. stupid. Mm -hmm. But it pushes me to, to be brave, and I'm, I'm, it's only in spaces that I feel, yeah, more comfortable that there is that, um, there is some trust built. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's been a lot of trust built definitely with the organizers of this event, which mm -hmm. I really appreciate. Yeah. Um, because it's, if someone randomly were to approach me without having done all of this extensive mm -hmm. work, like events like this don't just happen, right? Mm -hmm. I've organized enough events in my day jobs to know. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of intentional care. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so now I'm like more open, I'm like, okay, yeah, or criticism, I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm, mm. I'm open to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but definitely for, you know, it's unfortunate that I had this perception growing up that, oh, this is, you know, I didn't even consider going to art school. Mm. It wasn't an option. There's lots of factors around that. Definitely some of it's, you know, familial and cultural around, you know, going to university and doing something practical. But there was all, I could have pushed back. I could have been like, no, I'm going to art school you know, I, this is what I want to do. But I didn't even think to do it because I thought, well, I don't know if I belong there. So maybe I'll try academia. Mm. <laughs> don't really feel like I belong there that well either. But it was just <laughs> definitely art, the art world. I just had an, a gut feeling that it, it wasn't necessarily going to be nice to me. And I didn't mm -hmm. want to do that to myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, okay. There's a lot. I want to unpack a few things before we go on to the next one. So, I mean, point one. Like, I think my, my sort of summary of the role of art criticism, like, for one, it's only my take on it. And it's definitely 
only the uh, normative kind of art world capitalist take on it. Mm -hmm. And so to, to sort of understand it from that point of view or to see it, maybe to see it from that point of view, you know, it, it only makes sense really to the art that puts itself within that mechanism, within that machine of the capitalist infrastructure of the art world. And I guess I think a lot of what potentially could come out of this today might be, you know, what other, what other mechanisms are possible? Um, because uh, capitalism isn't working out so well for a lot of things. Um, but yeah, so just to, just to say like, you know, I don't want my, my sort of take on it to be the, the verbatim uh, dictionary definition of the be all end all of art criticism. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, maybe it's worth reflecting. Like when I started out, I was, you know, 24 and I started writing for a magazine in London called ID uh, where I had to suddenly just do the back pages art reviews. And I was, you know, I was still, we, we were all just on email, but you know, we were handed like a pack of press releases like that. And you were told, okay, you got 48 hours, come up with the back pages. And you're like, oh crap, what? So you're kind of sifting through this stuff. You don't even know how to make sense of it. You don't have enough time to run around and see it. And, and, and you do the best you can with what you can cobble together. But it was really only like 15 years down the line and moving away. Weirdly, my career has been much more interesting and fruitful having left London in the last two years. Like you leave the art world and I'm in Saanich Peninsula and I'm having far more interesting conversations and making a lot more interesting work. I think not undue to the perspective of distance. But, um, you know, so I think my career was very frenetic for those first few years. And and then you start, I started writing for free as well. Oh, wow, exciting, like big art magazine. Um, but I... You know, I was asked to write for it, so what did I do but look at what was in the pages and then simply replicate mm -hmm. with my name mm -hmm. and, and my writing very similar assessments and summaries of work. And I think at that point, to be brutally honest, I, I lacked the confidence and courage to go and engage with artists directly, to ask them about their work, because mm -hmm. I was so young mm -hmm. and I wanted to be in the magazine. So it was coming from a position of fear, but then I'm also suddenly implicated within the machine and the mechanism itself. And I'm, even though, you know, half Punjabi, uh, feminist writer, whatever, I'm still replicating the, the problematic infrastructure in the machine that, uh, you know, that really I'm only starting to become really critically aware of with the distance, the physical distance and the time distance since then. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I think, yeah, so, you know, that's pretty brutally honest, but there we go. We are what we are. We're all flawed and we're all biased. Um, and like, yeah, art critics, I read this quote when I was sort of prepping stuff in the notes um, today, like someone who's a big, big journalist art crit critic for a big uh, broadsheet newspaper in London, uh, is quoted in this book saying, art critics are spectators who say what they think. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's, that's a fair enough, fair enough statement, but there's a great deal of privilege, I think, that goes along with that, that, that one, you can say what you think, and two, that people will listen to it. Um, and so, uh, you know, so I guess part of today is, is, is providing space so that we can find other ways to say what we think. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And I guess I think an underlining theme that I kind of want to throw out there so that the audience can start thinking about it and so that we can maybe discuss it as we, as we move through the conversation is, you know, is there a form of art criticism that can be both critical and accessible? Can, can these two things work side by side? Can they be symbiotic? Um, okay. So I think, Sally, I'm going to come over to you for the next sort of main question. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we could refer to as tokenism, um, or for lack of a better word, diversity. And I, I say that because diversity, to me, is a problematic term because it, it kind of reinforces this idea that there's a, a norm, that there's something at the core that's the main and the norm, and that everything else outside of that is, is different and other and diverse. And therefore, we're all better if we diversify, but we're diversifying by reinforcing the idea that there's a norm at the core of it. Um, and so, so you've talked, um, when we were talking conversations in preparing the event about using Mandarin in your art. Um, and I was wondering um, if you wanted to sort of reflect a little bit more on that and tell us how, how discussion and recording of art can itself be impacted by tokenism or by perceived ideas of tokenism and diversity? Yeah, I think um, around the language piece, and this is something that I've only been learning about 
in the last like year or so around more specifically the language that we call Mandarin and how it came about historically. So this is this is me like geeking out hard. Uh, and I already did this <laughs> when we met earlier because it was just so fascinating. But essentially, I don't speak the same languages as my grandparents because of a series of his really rapid historical things that happened in the last hundred years in the country that in English we call China, where essentially both sets of grandparents on either side spoke a, 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 like their ancestral dialect, which I don't understand at all. And then my mom understands, but doesn't speak her ancestral dialect. Um, and my dad speaks the ancestral dialect of a group of people called the Hakka, um, which translates to guest family. And literally there are Hakka like all around the world. It's really not that special. There's like millions everywhere. Um, and it's an ethnic group that originated in Northern China, but then kind of moved through and settled kind of all over Southern China, but again, all around the world. Um, so he speaks that dialect. And then, um, then they both learned Cantonese because we, were in southern China, but then because of the, the ways that, that country China has changed since the 1940s and onwards, Mandarin was created. So that's a really quick history of just all of these different languages consolidating. And now I speak Mandarin, but I understand Cantonese. And the reason for that is because, you know, in school that was what I learned. And then I moved to Canada and then we all learned English and also learned a bit of French. And then, then I was like, well, why not? Let's learn Spanish. And I don't actually speak French or Spanish, but it's just there's this multiplicity. So it's very diverse, all this diverse linguistic. But then at the same time, when, I, when I'm writing and I think about using Mandarin, I realize that you know, it's also really political. And so I'm sure everyone's following the current events in Hong Kong. And so then, then I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to align myself politically. And it just gets really messy. And I realize that it's, it's actually taking away from my artistic or poetic message. And then I'm like, okay, so am I using English then? Because that seems almost neutral, but obviously English is not neutral. Mm -hmm. So these are the thoughts that have been swirling around in my brain for the last year or so, just doing a lot of self-reflection, thinking, how do I, how do I express myself when there are all of these different things going on there? And then around tokenization too, I think I, I often have tried to ask myself, am I self-tokenizing? Mm -hmm. You know, in how am I representing myself? Am I trying to accentuate certain parts of myself for certain reasons? Mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, I mean, again, like I said, I tried really hard to stay away from, from monetizing my art. And part of that is because I'm, you know, tapped into another system of capitalism, essentially, like I have another day job. But so I try really hard to protect my, my mm -hmm. art from that, but, you know, to varying levels. And so I think, like, am I trying to accentuate certain um, quote unquote exotic or tokenistic parts of myself because that makes me special. And so when, when I submit to a literary magazine, they're gonna be like, oh, English poem, English poem, ooh, English poem with a little bit of mm -hmm. different characters that we have to put into Google Translate. This makes it special. I'm, I'm gonna remember this. <laughs> Let's publish it. This is great. Mm -hmm. That makes me feel really mm -hmm. icky, although it might mm -hmm. have happened. The only poem that I have had published in like a bigger, you know, literary magazine was one that had a few you know, Chinese characters. And so there's a part of me that has to wonder, is it because of that or is it because the poem? It was in a satirical magazine and I thought it was, I, th I thought the poem was hilarious. And I'm really, I was really glad that other people thought so too, because a lot of times I make art because I think things are funny. But it, it's just a nagging thought in myself. Mm -hmm. Like, did I, did I just self-tokenize? Mm -hmm. Because no other poem in the book had other, as far as I can remember, had, you know, any sort of other language. Mm -hmm. So those are a lot of the thoughts I kind of, and, and I don't have any answers, and it really depends on how I feel day to day and what I learn, because it's a continual process, like all of the stuff around the language piece. Nobody taught me that. My parents don't, didn't really think about that. I wasn't taught that in school. It was me going out and looking for this information, and of course finding it. There's information out there if you look for it. Um, so I, I, it'll, it'll probably change as I progress in my knowledge as a person and my practice, my art practices. And I don't know what the future holds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Would either of you like to respond? Like, you know, the perceptions of tokenism and the perceptions of diversity and how that impacts your art practice before mm -hmm. it's even put out there to be received and criticized. I know, um, I think, Lindsay, when we first met, you were talking about the title change from mm -hmm. Squaw. Mm -hmm. And Serena, you were talking about the use of. Punjabi mm -hmm. in your work. Would either of you like to respond? 
Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, so I've like recently trying, been trying to you know, just re-engage with Punjabi. Uh, I wasn't raised with it, um, and the Punjabi that my you know my family speaks is also again not the same Punjabi that is spoken in the Punjab. Um, it's you know it's been corrupted or it's 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 you know evolved um, in different directions, and uh, it's yeah I've been wanting to learn. Uh, Punjabi again, and unfortunately, there's like no places in town that offer classes except for like the Sikh temple. So I'm gradually like trying to engage with that language again, and I'm also trying to engage with it with my writing. Um, and then I, yeah, I think a lot about what you were just saying about self tokenization, and um, I wasn't even thinking about it in that lens. You know, is me including Punjabi in my poems uh, actually, you know, making them more exotic? Is it making them more marketable? Um, uh, Yeah, I, it's a it's a it's big a, question. It's a really it's big, it's a really big question. Thought, yeah. Um, yeah, I also think about because I I do take on the role of critic with um, you know the, the work that I do with literary journals um, mm -hmm. with the Malhat Review. Um, I edit creative nonfiction, and um, I think about the expectations that I place on the pieces that I read. Um, recently, we read um, a really excellent uh, travel piece um, by a white cis male author, and uh, we were thinking about, you know, this, the writing in this is stellar, and at the same time, this author is not locating themselves in their relationship to the land. It's not, it's not the, where they're from, and it's, um, is this becoming voyeuristic, I guess, and mm. At the same time, like so much travel writing has been based around that kind of that voyeurism, that you know absence of relationship to the land, mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, yeah, how do we move forward with mm. you know trying to evaluate writing while while at the same time not just saying oh all writing has to have a specific relationship to the land, so we don't want to be you know prescribing what writing mm -hmm. has to be, but at the same time we don't want to be. I guess just treating everything the same. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, mm -hmm. it's tricky. Yeah, yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. I think when you were speaking, there was that moment where you said, you know, when I was 24, I was just doing what everybody else was doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're entering into a conversation, you know, that is about decolonizing. Mm -hmm. And um, collectively, you know, the people mm -hmm. that are engaged in these conversations are having the opportunity to stop and reflect. And if you think of, you know, the underbelly of that work, it's been, you know, from the people of color and indigenous voices mm -hmm. that have been, um, you know, trudging those pathways of visibility. Because if you look at what's been dominant, it's been um, the non-indigenous mm -hmm. and uh, people of color continuing to be silenced. And so writing is just another form of that. Writing has just been another form of silencing indigenous voices and people of color. And um, so everything, I think it's not just, oh, we're having these conversations today. This is um, decades of mm -hmm. work that has been um, infiltrated into our arts community. Mm -hmm. And I think about, um, you know, the impact of uh, the Canadian art system, including writing and its impact on Indigenous arts. I think of potlatch bands and I think of, I don't know my language, I can't speak my language, you know, and that's a really hard uh, place to be when you're, and I spoke about this last time, when you're in community and an elder comes up to you and they speak in Mohawk to you and you have to respond with, I don't know what that means, I can't speak my language. And so I think when we think of language and there's, there's grief involved in that, there's, there's loss and, and pain and um, I don't think it's just a matter of fact of me not being able to speak my language or not, but you know, how do I walk in this world true to my indigenous roots without having to compensate or sacrifice um, to be seen? And this is, I think, a lot with indigenous people have, you know, walked that route of how can I be successful? And, you know, they talk about it in walking in two worlds to know who you are. And, but you need to know the white way too, to be successful in this world. And so I think it's these conversations that we have 
um, as Indigenous peoples in our communities around maintaining that integrity of who we are. And I think about it in the institution with all of these courses and these themes and, you know, Indigenous education being at the root of, of some of the departments and, and you know, and the work that they're, they're trying to, to instill. And still, it, it's, it, you can't decolonize a colonial system, mm -hmm. you know. I think decolonization is, is at this point, you know, um, we don't even know, we don't even understand the impacts of colonization in a very, uh, in a very real way. You know, it, it's, we have these um, narratives that have come forward from, you know, residential school survivors and these very difficult truths about our, our country. And there's still people in this world that think that uh, brown people are less than, you know, and we want to change uh, people's thinking and minds and and sometimes I, I feel like that's not my my role my role is to um, make the art that I care about and that I that I'm passionate about and not to um, not to uh, sacrifice that in any way and, and that's a hard place to be on a personal level too because there's all these ways of I think sometimes indigenous, maybe not even just indigenous art gets treated as what's fashionable mm. you know what's what who's hip and who's hopping and you know who's making the, the the you know the the exhibition and and all like i think there's that art world that really you know teases out more colonial behaviors to manifest and perpetuate and i i guess i've always been a, a big believer in in dealing with what's in my own backyard and you know, and it's really about grassroots. I think for me, very community oriented, very on the ground, you know, uh, frontline type of person. And you know that uh, drive to be in larger institutions and exhibitions isn't my focus. Mm -hmm. And so I don't feel like I'm in the grasp of art criticism mm -hmm. because it doesn't. It's not really on my radar. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, did I work with, you know, uh, a family who doesn't have a lot of money, but, you know, that we sat around and we split cedar together for the uh, for an afternoon. That's that's really where my heart is at. Mm. And so our criticism, I think, you know, it, value it, yeah, it has it, it's colonial. It's mm -hmm. it, it will always be colonial. And I think having opportunities to have um, a reflection, I think. Is something even that could be really beautiful to mm -hmm. implement in terms of archive and documenting and capturing this moment. You know, audiences in this position of consuming, we are such a consuming, greedy, gluttonous, you know, society that, you know, we never ask ourselves as an audience, what can I contribute to this? Mm. You know, what part of my spirit am I am I giving away? What part of uh, of a position of power do I, that I'm in have I delegated? And I think that's really what this is about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's having an opportunity to stop. And, and I think that's what decolonizing is, the beginning stages of it. It's like, just stop. Stop what you're doing. Stop what you've always done. Stop being on automatic mm. um, there's a world that is hurting and there's people that are dying and we are in very hard difficult times and um, I don't care who's written about in a magazine at this mm. point in time mm. is that bad no <laughs> No, I, I no, sound like good. I'm careless, but it's not. I'm no, you sound like you're caring. Yeah. I think that's. I think it's the opposite. I sound like. I think it sounds like you're caring. You're mm. just caring about something other than your own particular gain mm. in a capitalist art world. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I might jump ahead one question, then I'll come back to the mm -hmm. previous one, because everyone kind of touched on first languages and second languages mm. there, and. You know, when, when, when Rance and Reagan and I have been meeting with each of you and with the other speakers in the second panel about 
about what these conversations might um, cover. You know, it was always touch on what you know what could what could a critical and accessible form of art criticism look like. Um, you know, what language would it take? Maybe it's oral rather than written, and what what languages could it be in? And so I think it's useful to um, maybe just speak a bit more again about. English and what other languages we speak, if any, um, because you know I think English uh, can have this sort of negative connotation along with whiteness and and being part of the other side of that coin. But when we first met for our sort of discussion brainstorming session, Lindsay, you said, um, you know, is it not somewhat beautiful that we're all able to sit here sharing thoughts mm -hmm. precisely because we all share English mm -hmm. as a language? And oh, sorry, I'm you know I'm half Punjabi. My father was born in in the Punjab in part that became um, Pakistan, and then had to migrate during the partition into what then became India, and uh, and then he was within you know one of the first families into the Midlands in Leicester in England, um, which is you know in a in a very very white period in Britain in the 1950s, and uh, him being one of six, they all basically untaught themselves Punjabi um, and spoke only with their mother, with my grandmother, mm -hmm. and all married someone white and taught none of me and my cousins a word of Punjabi because they felt they were doing us a favor because they had to almost hide it so that they wouldn't get beaten up and penalized in school for it, and so. The result then, it's almost like I'm one, because then my father grew up in England and then we emigrated here to Canada in the early 80s when I was a baby. So then I have this experience of being half Punjabi but not speaking a word of it. Um, and, uh, and my first language, and really my only language being English, my French is pretty abysmal. So, you know, the, 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 that's, that, you know, my own sort of relationship to my first and second languages is very tied to colonialism. So I don't know if you each want to maybe just reiterate a little bit more your, your experience of what is your first language and with another, with a second. Who would like to begin? Do you want to do you sure, want to rip I, I off could, the Punjabi yeah, I could, thing? Yeah, I could rip off yeah. the Punjabi thing. I, like, yeah, as I mentioned, I, I want to learn Punjabi. And the thing is, like, there's nowhere in town to learn it. Um, it's just not something that's really featured. And I, all I those apps. I feel like we might need to do a podcast I together. I think I do need to do a podcast. I, I feel like we should. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, yeah, none of the apps also offer it. Like, Rosetta Stone, uh, Duolingo, you know, the owl doesn't have yeah, it. You know, there's, really? anyways. Yeah, it's really surprising. Because it's very, it's very much, it's like the most, a commonly spoken, I think, South Asian language in the well, on the West Coast, I think. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, again, like it's something I want to I want to try to find a tutor through the Sikh temple here, you know. Um, but uh, again, like my relationship with English, like that's something that you know, again, it's my first language. It's basically my only language. Um, I know snippets of French, and again, yeah, snippets of Punjabi. But um, even my relationship with English has like you know evolved over time. I did. A little bit of studies, um, like I did a class on Old English in my undergrad, and I like really, really appreciated like just learning the history of English and how you know um, so much of the words that we have around the senses and around you know embodiment um, have come to us from you know uh, Germanic languages, and so much of the words around you know intellectual pursuits and intellectual kind of non embodied kind of. Um, language has come to us from Latinate and Romance kind of origins. And um, I think a lot about that in my own writing, you know, once you've, you know, really studied a language and really understood the history of it, you do analyze that in your own writing and when the words choice that you have. And uh, yeah, I think about, um, you know, colonization does involve a bit of a disembodiment, you know, a, dis a disconnection between yourself and the land and yourself and your own body. and um, I think, yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, English itself being colonized and, you know, mixed together with a bunch of different mm -hmm. ingredients. Um, yeah. And also, I guess, yeah, like, I guess, I mean, it, the easy thing to think about is just academia, how it's so based around these Latin words and mm. there's all the jargon is, you know, there's no, there's no real Germanic jargon mm. words, I would say, mm -hmm. in, in English, you know, I would... Like I can't think of one, anyways. Mm -hmm. Whereas all the Latin words are, you know, you know, all the ologies and all the isms. Uh, isms, yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sally, did you wanna? Yeah, I have some first and second languages. Thoughts. Um, I think all languages are beautiful in different mm -hmm. ways. There are times when I read an English sentence that just stops me in my tracks. I'm like, oh, 
whew, like the sentence got me really excited because it's just beautiful and like the punctuation is just perfect. Like I'm sure we've all, hopefully we've, hopefully we've all had, <laughs> maybe it's just, <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I overshared. So, and those moments are really special to me and I'm really thankful that I can read English, which, you know, is not my first like it's probably technically my third language, mm -hmm. although it is the one I speak and understand and write the best in. And then there are moments like for me, Cantonese is a really funny language because I grew up watching a lot of uh, like Hong Kong uh, like comedies, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so there are jokes in Cantonese that are just funnier than in any, any, any other language that I understand at least. And it just isn't as funny when you translate it into Mandarin. Um, and then there are things in Mandarin that's really beautiful too, and there are phrases in, in Mandarin or Chinese where it's just, you can't translate it, right? Every language has this. And there are moments where I'm talking to somebody who doesn't speak, you know, Chinese, and I just wish I could, like, it's this really, it's, it's almost like a physical frustration that I can't express this term, and I'll try to translate it. But obviously translation is its own field, and you need to be really good at it to do it well. And then there are also, you know, in, because I've moved around Canada for work and, and various reasons, I've picked up or have, have been taught or have learned bits of different indigenous languages. And they're also really beautiful, very challenging for me because I have no basic understanding or basis for it. And of course, not being in a place long enough, um, it, it's just hard to pick up a language. But I spent a few months uh, in Nunavut for a practicum placement and Inuktitut is stunning, just a really beautiful language. And a lot of the indigenous languages to my ear, you know, it's very much connected to land. So some of the sounds, many of the sounds are connected to the physical location. So when I was there, you know, in I was living and working in Iqaluit and it's a, technically a city, but you know, it's pretty, it's a town by, by like, if you compare it to Victoria, let's say. And so all of a sudden you're hiking, like to get to, get to a friend's house, you, you can just walk across the tundra because there are no trees and so you're pretty much you're just like hiking and so when you're walking through the tundra you're hearing the sounds and a lot of the sounds it, there's no trees so then it's whistling wind right really strong wind and there are many times where I was like I am getting I'm gonna get blown over 60 70 kilometer winds and and when you listen to language I hear elements of that yeah. and I spent a couple years when I was younger living in uh, northern Alberta in a town called uh, Athabasca and I learned and I could be wrong but this is what I was uh, told that the word Athabasca which you know is used there's like a glacier there's a river lots of things are named and then the peoples is um, it means the sound the of wind through the aspens and so when, when you say Athabasca you can kind of hear that mm -hmm. and oh yeah like I would lay as a 10 year old lie on the grass and you could hear the wind whistling through the aspen trees. And I don't think there are any, as I haven't seen any aspen trees here. Um, it's just different climate. And then here, you know, as I'm getting to know the local languages here, I haven't been here as long, and, and um, but I, I also hear aspects of that. And so that's, that's really beautiful to, to know that every single language, you know, it's connected to a land somewhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know about the history of English nearly as well, but or Latin, but I'm sure at some point it was also connected to a land and a mm -hmm. peoples that were indigenous to a place. But then through time, like any tool, you know, it changes when you pass from people to people and it, it, it gets imbued with meaning and symbolism. Now in our current time, English is associated with colonialism. Mm -hmm. For, for many and and business and commerce like when I think about English yeah it's like very you know it's very good at talking about policy and things like that uh, and to that effect it's very effective for better or for worse whether it's colonial policy or you know whichever else and so I think I think any language can be corrupted in that way too mm. then you know um, paying attention to geopolitics like Chinese who knows what it's a beautiful classical language that thousands of years of poetry it could be also used in a different way. It just depends on how people use it. Mm -hmm. But it can also be used for good. And so I, I just think want to think more about language as tools. And I think that there is we can be intentional about how we use language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you want to respond, Lindsay? Mm -hmm. Are you happy to leave that one? Yeah, I guess what's on my mind, again, is just the, the uh, where we're at as uh, just so much loss of language here, you know, and um, 
and I don't know why it's so hard for, I mean, maybe not, I don't, no, I need to not talk right you now. You want to just reflect? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Is that me? When, okay, I'll go yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah, well, may, maybe it's something we can come back to mm -hmm. as a group. Yeah, I mean, loss of language. I, I think even the reteaching of language, uh, how it's retaught, um, mm -hmm. it falls under yeah, different colonial structures. Um, I did. There's a. I heard a nice term when I was listening to a podcast um, about indigenous languages and that uh, sleeping languages mm. rather than extinct, which I thought was a quite a beautiful turn mm -hmm. of phrase. And that it's children, obviously, who are yeah. reawakening them, who are mm -hmm. learning the fluency again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, sorry, something's squeaking. All right, one of our mics is close to the other or something. Okay. So, how is everyone doing in the audience? Are we comfortable? Are we okay? All right. I'm kind of aware that these are like kind of deep probing. Um, difficult questions I'm asking you, and I, it was sort of around half two that I thought we'd sort of move into our final question and then maybe open it up to the floor. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one more question before we go into that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, of course. And, and then I can always <laughs> dig them up in the Q&A session otherwise. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so I was reading this week, um, and there is our reading list somewhere in the program and material that Rance put together, or maybe it's over on the table. It's so on the table. So we've created this reading list, um, sort of the texts that each of us thought were interesting and useful um, in, in kind of our thinking and preparing for this event. And we, I thought it was particularly telling that there was almost zero art texts and art criticism texts on it. So that's maybe telling a little gap and a problem that they're in. But there was one book that um, I read because Rance recommended it to me earlier this week. Um, Amy Fung's uh, recent book of essays, uh, is it before I was a critic, I was a human being? Yeah. Have I got the title right? And uh, it's, it's a really beautiful, almost book-length land acknowledgement in which she reflects on indigenous artists in Canada, immigration, decolonization, and a whole lot of messy space in between. Uh, and, and she writes this in a sort of series of essays and various anecdotes about her life and her travels and her looking at art. And, and there's one anecdote towards the end of the book where she talks about being in a group uh, uh, I think there. I think it might be a sort of public public event in regards to the Sobe Art Award or something. Mm. Uh, and she's waiting to ask a question, and the the moderator never comes to her with a question. Mm. So I'm going to ask her question. Mm. I'm going to ask it to us. So um, it is a question about legibility, mm. um, and and the idea that are are there missing areas of knowledge um, and and narratives between the audience and who you may even envisage as your sort of audience of your work um, and the work. And, and does, do you feel that your work is legible in terms of Canadian art and identity? Um, how, how do you communicate um, all of the narratives and all of the, all of the backstory contained within the work to the audience? Is, is that possible to do within the work itself? Is that the role of a curator? Mm -hmm. Or a, or a critic, or a writer, or a docent in, an, in, a, in a gallery or something. Um, and do you feel um, do you feel that your work is maybe presented with an invisible barrier? Mm -hmm. So that was Amy Fung's question, but I didn't give this one to you in the pre notes, so it's a little bit heavy to hand you. But do you have do you have any thoughts on legibility? Do do you feel do you have an ideal audience, and is your work immediately legible to them? I mean, I think my ideal audience is me. Like, that's who I write for, is me and my communities, I guess. Um, and then everybody else is just kind of secondary, um, which, you know, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's who I'm writing for. Um, I'm not going to apologize for that. Um, um, <laughs> a lot of the reading, a lot of the writing that I read these days is online. It's stuff that's been circulated, you know, internationally. Um, you know, around, you know, transgender, around, you know, um, indigenous and people of color identities and the intersections between them. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that I'm really just interested in and excited to really engage with. Um, I was just in Portland recently and I picked up an amazing a book called Decolonizing Transgender 101. And it's a self-published book just talking about, yeah, that, that intersection between trans identities and racialized identities. And it's just thoroughly non-academic, and it's just, I just love it so much because it's just, it's been developed in kind of an opposition to and, you know, outside of really that institutional kind of lens. And it's for the community that it's mm -hmm. a part of. Um, 
And that's, that's I think, that's what I want my writing to be able to do, is speak to the communities that I'm a part of. Mm -hmm. And um, to not try to, I guess, tick off every box and, mm -hmm. you know, speak to every possible person, because um, no writing can speak to everyone. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to respond? I, the only thing that's coming up for me with that um, is the conversation that we had about um, the the title of this mm. of squaw, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so we were talking about I, I forget the conversation, but it was about uh, my experience working with curators and working with the gallery in terms of my relationship as an artist, and I had a very uh, interesting kind of relationship with the Legacy Gallery in that way that I had just actually walked in there. I had developed this body of work, uh, of work that I titled Squaw. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and this title Squaw is and was um, a word used in history to oppress Indigenous women. And um, I mean, it's been used in Hollywood films and, and different old romanticized books of indigenous peoples and um, it, it has and had its um, influence in uh, perception of what a native woman and her identity is based on that negative connotation of squaw. And so I, I really use uh, photography um, as a means to uh, push this first word internally back to an indigenous woman for her to process and by the time that I had finished this body of work that I titled Squaw I had photographed over 20 indigenous women and we talked a lot about sexuality relationship to body relationship to um, you know the influence of media imagery film how this all impacted our relationship to ourselves the murdered and missing indigenous women um, and our relationship to our own families and our histories um, and basically it was really about a project of self-worth and really mm -hmm. having an opportunity to really sink into that in a way that I gave the opportunity for the person to revision or restory or have an opportunity to portray an image that was in defiance actually of what Squaw uh, had carried throughout history. But that didn't come right away. By the time I got into these conversations with curators, there are these conversations where they, they, they say, how do you think people are going to feel about that word? Um, how are you going to um, protect yourself and the images in the gallery from people that are coming in with, um, you know, their own perversions? Mm -hmm. And how are you going to protect the work from um, being ex continuing to be exploited? Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm dealing with female bodies, nudity, um, mm -hmm. sexuality, they're, they're very sensitive, personal mm -hmm. um, themes to, to work with. Um, and so it, it got me thinking, so in, the, in these relationships as artists, when you start to work with curators and galleries, more conversations really start to flesh out the work. And I think when you're an artist, and, and I don't have a lot of experience with exhibition, and that was a very pivotal time of me understanding about um, my relationship to to that space, to that cube, mm. and to that history. And um, they had a lot more experience than me as, as a curator in understanding the history, the privilege. Um, and it was through conversation with um, some of the curators and some people that I had trusted from UVic, and we were having a conversation, and they had said, do you want that word to be continue to use in your community? Are you trying to reclaim that word as squaw and then change it into something mm -hmm. else? And mm -hmm. I said, I don't think so. Mm. I said, I think I'm trying to create imagery that's in defiance. Mm -hmm. And they're like, there's your title, right? And so I think when you're navigating as an artist, you're very much in the, the eye. You're very much in this kind of world. And I live a lot there. <laughs> 
you know, in the dream, in the vision, in the emotion, in the urge. It's very visceral when I'm when I'm doing my practice. It's 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 some intellectual stimulation along the way, but it's it's very comes from the sacred. It comes from the spiritual realm. It comes from um, you know these very unpredictable, unknown spaces. And that's what I really appreciate when you start to be in relationship with curators that are part of these discussions around decolonization, really holding the artists, really understanding the backstory of mm. the work, spending time with wanting to be protective of you from um, the critique, the very uh, harsh blow that can come down. And I think galleries are afraid of that blow. Institutions are afraid of that blow mm. from anything too powerful internally to, to blow things up. Don't be too loud. Don't be too quiet, you know. And so when you're new to being an artist and you're at this point now where you're able to be in a position of presenting an exhibitions, it's a big moment. I remember the opening of that exhibition, I cried and I was emotional because it was that dream of being a, a small child, of wanting to be an artist, you know? But I think that if we don't care for one another in our communities and we don't, um, and if we continue to um, gossip and lateral violence, it's a very sensitive time, it's a very political time. And we need to be very conscientious of who we're getting into relationship with. You know, and, I, and, and what I've learned in terms of collaboration in this last while, it, it's really about the conscious contract. How do we create conscious contracts with artists, curators, writers, um, anybody within the arts that is about a, a consciousness? I know who you are when I'm working with you. I know where your weaknesses are when I'm working with you. I know what you're capable of doing to me or to yourself if we go into conflict. Who are you when we're in conflict? You know, and this is something that I'm, I've, I've learned the hard way. Mm. And so when it comes to criticism, it's not just about writing and art critique, it's about our peers, our colleagues, how we speak to one another. You know, one thing that I'm always conscientious of is when I hear in community, don't work with that person. Mm. Don't work with that person, they're difficult. And when I hear that, I also, it makes me emotional and sad because it doesn't give that person an, uh, an opportunity to transform, mm. you know. And when we're not caring for one another in this community, it's very small. Victoria is a very small arts community. And when we're not caring for one another and, and um, instilling those values from our cultures that are all so beautiful, like love and kindness and respect and trust, um, we perpetuate colonialism and violence in our own arts community. And, um, and so we want to have these intellectual conversations about decolonization, and then we can't even maintain our own integrity to how we speak about ourselves and other people. And so, you know, it's about being congruent, you know, how you walk and how you talk and the values that you want to put forward, not just in creating the work, but ex exhibiting the work and holding that work it's it's not to, it, it's a community effort to be able to do that and to be able to be um, I think responsible and um, relevant and all of those five R's I think that we need to adopt them in everything that we do I think they need to be ingrained in terms of guidelines like asking yourself when I write this about this person and counseling we're very very conscientious and mindful of when you write a final report about, about a client you never want to tag it and frame it as a negative, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise, if you think about the history of documentation and writing and policy and law, it's an extremely violent um, history, you know, and, uh, and that still maintains today in our constitution and in our human rights. And, and so the power of pen to paper is something that I think we do have to stop and we have to say, how do we write how do we, what position am I sitting in um, and what is the end goal or what am I contributing to? Is it perpetuating violence and colonization or am I trying to practice liberation and freedom from, you know, the constraints that we live in as, as indigenous peoples that are trying to be visible in this world, in this larger art world? Um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, I think, 
I'm just looking at the time, and I think you, you really started to give quite a beautiful answer there to my next question. So I'm going to build off of what you said and then say it back, and maybe Serena and Sally can respond, and then we can open it up to the floor. Um, because we've been talking, you know, the intention of this discussion was to, to sort of pose the question of what might be possible if the existing forms didn't exist. What, what might it look like? What might it feel like? What languages might it be in? How, how might it be negotiated between people involved? What, what other models could exist? What other models could be possible? And so I think you've touched really beautifully there on ideas of, um, what did you call it, conscious contract? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, so this idea of a two-way relationship. Um, um, so I think maybe I put this sort of final question to you all and, and maybe building off of what Lindsay has, has said and maybe then if you want to come in at the end and respond. So Serena or Sally, who would like... Do you want to start first, Sally? Yeah, I, I, ooh, that was such a great response and I'm just still thinking about it, but the <laughs> conscious contract, that really resonates with me because I think, you know, for me it's about really trying to be intentional, right? It takes a lot of intentionality. And this is part of the, my, I was kind of, I thought you might come to me with the legibility thing, so I was like trying to prepare for it. Oh, right. oh sorry, but, did you, if you have, did you well, have something I'll, on legibility? I'll, I'll we, can come, we can weave it back I don't in. have a okay. lot, but because, yeah, I think, I think we enter into a conscious contract with the, with our audiences too, right? And as an, both an audience member, or consumer of art or art viewer and the person creating the art, you know, for me in terms of legibility, I do my best to communicate. Like I'm, I, whatever I put out there, Obviously, I think it's good enough. Otherwise, I would keep it. A lot of stuff I keep hidden. There's a lot of like bad art that I have stashed away in, in, in my house. But whatever I'm putting out there, I'm saying, this is me doing my best, and I'm trying to say something, and I think it's important, so here you go. And then as the person consuming, and I, I try to do this when I'm looking at other people's art or reading or viewing in, in some way, I try to do that work too. If I don't understand what they're trying to say, I try to think about, what, why don't I understand? What, am I, what information am I missing? What can I learn about this? And especially if they're not from a background that I know much about or, or, or uh, share, then I, I really try to do the work of thinking, okay, do I need to look for other information instead of thinking like, oh, this doesn't make sense. Like, what's going on here? And that's the kind of criticism that, when going back to my initial answer around why I stayed away from art criticism, is I just had this <coughs> image of somebody who's like, your art doesn't make sense and I'm not gonna do any work and I don't want to do any extra work of finding out why you are saying this and therefore I'm gonna pronounce it you know, irrelevant. And that's not the type of community that I want to be in. But if, I'm, if there is a space where an artist can put out something and the, the people, whether it's peers, other artists or uh, whoever it is, will at least promise to do their best to be conscious and intentional and trying to understand what this person is saying and being respectful, essentially, to be like, okay, this is what you've put out here. I understand aspects of it. It's res some parts are resonating. There's, there's missing information that I'm going to go out and try to understand because I'm committed to, you know, to paying attention to what you have to say or, or draw or write. That, that's the space that I would like to be a part of, both, again, as somebody who's putting, creating and consuming. Serena? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that whole term, that whole idea of the conscious contract, I feel is, is yeah, I, I really, I really deal with that. Um, and I think about a lot what I was saying earlier about relationships and how we were saying now about, you know, having relationships with our, you know, uh, having contracts with our relationships. Um, and the flip side that I think about in terms of relationships is accountability. Um, uh, you know, if our relationships, uh, if we're acting if critics and if artists and if audiences are acting in ways that are careless or um, ignorant or uh, unintentionally erasing, um, where where do we bring in accountability? I guess you know how, our communities really are closed systems. If there's violence or erasure that's happening in our communities, it's going to reverberate around, mm -hmm. and um, unless we address it, it just continues to you know reproduce itself onwards and onwards. Um, so yeah, how do we bring in, I guess, community? I'm not sure if I have an answer, uh, but how do, you, yeah, how do we bring in that community accountability? Mm -hmm. And it, maybe it's, yeah, maybe it's just, you know, really solidifying what a conscious contract could be, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any last words? I just, think wanna... about, I just really think about the institution, like the power that mm -hmm. we're training 
uh, people to think about art, um, that needs to really explode open. It, it continues to maintain this very Eurocentric mm -hmm. colonial way of teaching and educating and receiving information and regurgitating. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't give the opportunity for the human being to really um, find truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really one part if we're going to be critical um, is really looking at our own process of how we were educated and, and doing that work of decolonizing, understanding how colonialism has impacted your thinking and how you think about things. And mm -hmm. only from that place of ad admitting, mm -hmm. admitting that there's something not right, maybe you don't know what it is specifically in this moment, um, but I feel like there's Lead, leaders in this uh, conversation, uh, for example, like Primary Colors, um, doing a, a very national, um, um, you know, movement to decolonizing in the arts in, in, in this country and really bringing forth uh, Indigenous voices and people of colour coming together to really look at the impacts of colonization on our arts communities and our artists. And um, so I'm really grateful that you two are here today. Um, I don't know if people know the work that um, they have been doing amongst many other artists, curators, scholars coming together for this movement, but um, I'm thankful that I've uh, participated and I know where to go because you two exist in that conversation. That. Um, yeah, and I'm grateful everybody else is here too. In, in some capacity, there's something that is part of you that are, is wanting to continue to unravel. And so that's the beautiful thing is when you unravel in a group, um, group consciousness, you have the opportunity to challenge belief systems that you, we can't do on our own. And so this is the learning um, style that I think is most effective for decolonizing is, is with others. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You couldn't have um, done a more beautiful segue there, I think, into <laughs> turning it <laughs> over to the floor. Um, okay, so, because you guys have been talking for some time now, and that was pretty intense, so I think it's good to give you a little bit of moment's pause. And hopefully some of the conversation has sparked some ideas um, within you sitting with us here. Um, so, you know, it's now time to kind of turn turn the, the floor over to you if you have questions, that's fine, but also if you just want to share comments or thoughts or reflections on, on things um, discussed earlier in the session or in particular into the ideas of, of what, what models might work, what might art criticism look like if it was coming from, from a position of, uh, of inclusivity from the get-go and not a Eurocentric model. Um, inclusivity itself having problems with the term, but anyway, you know, you get into a tailspin. So, um, <laughs> so uh, does would anyone like to start? You you what? Sorry, you always start, but you would not. You can't like help to start. it. You can't help it. No. Can I bring you a microphone? No. Okay. Um, over the last few. Years, with, I'm also I've done education in England, I was in St. Martin's, so I understand what you're talking about, but that London scene of art criticism, I, do, I used to write a lot of art criticism myself. Um, I wrote a piece a few years ago just asking, like, where is the avant-garde gone? And so then it led me on this whole, in the past 10 years, it's led me on this idea, like, we're all talking about today, on how to, to reclaim that art criticism. I still think it's important for students to sit back and have other people look and talk about the work just so they can make it better, not for it to be criticized, but for them to just find other avenues that maybe make it better. And, mm -hmm. um, I, I've kind of discovered that I, I started working on people just sort of life after, um, the art after the patriarchy, <coughs> right? And how and they kept reading back and reading back and reading back, and then you get to the sorry and you realize where it's all criticism and historical narrative has kind of stemmed from just that one guy, basically, mm -hmm. right? And he had, what, one female artist. Thousand artists or something. So, and then I just started thinking about ideas around when, 
uh, feminist art or when BIPOC art or, you know, all this artwork that's considered to be on the fringes becomes part of this grand historical narrative is when we have art after the patriarchy. And the only way I can, can see it happening is if we start using the intersectional feminist lens to, to critically observe work. And I don't know, like, that's just ideas I've been floating around okay. my head sitting alone in my studio at night. You know, so it's not like, I haven't had this opportunity to be able to talk to people. So mm -hmm. yeah. But within my own, like I teach at UBIC as well, and I teach a second year drawing class, and I found within my own critiques as well, I start stepping back mm -hmm. and not using that modernist, it's very modernist mm -hmm. as well, the critique, right? So I so stopped using that, and I've had a lot of discussions with Daniel and Robert and stuff in the department, and talking about how <coughs> pull away from those things, because like, I did my undergrad at UBIC, and now I'm standing in on critiques and like, on the fringes and listening and I'm still hearing the same narratives and it's mm -hmm. been 20 years mm -hmm. and I'm like these students can't be and I can't wrap my head around what to do right mm -hmm. so I try within my own within my class and we don't do much of a critique we just look at the work and we talk mm -hmm. about it and it's kind of where I leave it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want them to just work on their ideas and really get into the crux of their ideas as opposed to me telling them Mm -hmm. I think which is I felt like a lot of criticism was coming from. And when I went back into my own writings, I realized it's exactly what I did as well, like we were talking about earlier. So. Mm -hmm. But thank you for all your yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. But anyway, if you wanted to talk, if you had a comment. Yeah, does anyone <laughs> want to Comment on the comment? I, I hear what you're saying also in terms of, like, I know for, as an artist, um, I think having, and I, again, it, going back to relationship, people that can help you steer the work in a way that I always say, what I'm, what I'm wanting to do is it actually translating, you know, and I think we need those eyes, we need that mentorship, we need those apprentice relationships that, uh, um, and I think maybe teachers and instructors can develop relationships where it's not about, you know, telling the artist how to do the work, but um, being being an ally, being like a mentor in that way, um, I think could help with, with criticism and looking at things critically um, to make strong work. I think that's what we want our students to, to really, like you said, get into the nitty gritty of their ideas and be able to accentuate that in the best way possible. And I mean, art school is like that, you know, and then you're out in the world and who are those mentors? Who are those allies? Who are those, um, who is your art community that is going to take the time to come look at the work and help you to shape it and mold it? And um, yeah, I think I think we need to be able to, as artists, have have those people with us throughout our journey. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Comments? Yes. I, I, well, I have a question, um, maybe just uh, for the for the audience. Um, now, the sort of chance to ask questions. Um, I'm really interested in the who they are, what their work is, you know, what are they wanting to get out of their work, and is the thing we're asking them to do of value to them? Mm -hmm. You know, we might get all excited and we come across different folks doing different work, and we get all excited, oh, I want to work with them. Do they want to work with us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, we need to make sure that we get to know them, that we understand their practice, that the environment we're inviting them into is one that they'll thrive in or will challenge them in that good, constructive way or 
um, it's somewhere that they do want to share what they're doing and that their community will show up and support them there. So um, I think that's part of it, is, is knowing each other enough that we know when we're entering into that relationship um, what we're asking of each other and what conditions will be put in place right. for what will be what will we share, what will take place. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, I think that opportunity to engage in those conversations about the work and what it will do in that space. Um, and I think, Lindsay, you said the word reflection. I think that's, um, I think that's part of what I think the, the good part of our criticism does, is it allows for an opportunity for reflection, for constructive feedback to build on. Um, but you have to feel, you know, I think the closest people to us are the ones that can tell us what we really need to hear. So. Um, how do we get to know each other enough that we can do that with each other? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else respond? Yes. Yeah. Oh, um, I have a different question. Okay. okay. Should we just check if anyone else has to respond? Okay. Would anyone? Does anyone else want to respond to Rance's prompt with regards to conscious contracts or care within regards to their work? He does. Yes. first word that came to my mind was gratitude mm -hmm. and if you're going to get into that vulnerable space of expression there's almost I, I feel like there needs to be whether it's silent or blatantly said just an understanding of that emotional and intellectual labor that's going to take place mm -hmm. and when you can do that that's that's really powerful but to maintain gratitude throughout Sometimes it gets lost in translation, and especially if conflict comes up or like mm -hmm. uh, creative differences, which is inevitable because we're all individual, dynamic humans. Mm -hmm. But from the core of the, the gratitude piece, if you're going to do the work, I'm going to do the work. Let's get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's I think that's super cool. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Did anyone else? Okay. Your question? Yeah, I um, when I you heard when I heard you speak about the word criticism and discuss that topic, I started wondering whether artists ever in the past, and maybe you've been part of that conversation where they discussed the idea of replacing the word criticism with something else that has a totally different stigma. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. can you say it to me one more time and then I'll repeat it. <laughs> yes, so after hearing the discussion on the word criticism, yeah. I am wondering whether artists, or if you've, been, you've heard of this topic where there's been actually the idea of replacing the word criticism right. with another word that has a different stigma. So have, have artists at any point in art history? Uh, in 20th you, century, in contemporary? From what you've been part of. <laughs> have, have artists, uh, of which I'm aware, ever discussed the idea of replacing the word criticism with something else that carries with it a different stigma, or perhaps no stigma, or maybe no, no word can carry no stigma, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot think of any <laughs> off the top of my head. I'm just going through my Google Drive in my brain right now. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, the closest thing that I can think that is relevant is maybe 10 years ago at Goldsmiths, which is a big art college in London, Maria Fusco began an art writing program. And that was, and, and there are MAs in art criticism, but an art history, of course, but it was, it was art writing. And it was to try and be something between art making and critical and historical writing about art. It was where the writing itself becomes part of the um, creative practice. Mm -hmm. um, it's not creative writing, it's art writing. And it's quite odd. Um, I mean, and it's established and accepted as a, as a genre, of course, now. But, um, but it's somewhere between the two. And so, I mean, I can't, I don't know her well enough to sort of speak for her. I don't think it was, Maybe it was trying to replace art criticism. I think it was maybe trying to find a space between 
art making in a visual practice and art criticism in a, in a kind of written practice and trying to find a space between the two. And then there was someone else who's within that realm named Travis Jefferson, who I did my PhD with. And he did do a practice called object-oriented writing, I believe it was called, in which the art writing got even deeper and uh, a bit more out there by getting in there within the art making practice itself. Off the top of my head, those are the only sort of two I can think of. And they came very much from a position that was not really concerned with um, people of color or um, indigenous artists, but from a more like formalistic perspective on words and art. Um, which that does lead me to, maybe I'll throw this out, we'll just throw this out there in my response as a question to the group but, and, and, and to yourselves as well, because we didn't get to it in the conversation. Um, you know, there's this idea that if you're a, an artist or a writer, of color or, um, or indigenous or, or really from any marginalized group and, and you take on that politics within your practice and within your personal life, that you're, you know, you're carrying a great weight and a great burden um, because we're all only one person. None of us are gonna find all the solutions um, within our own practices. Um, and, you know, and it, it's a great burden on one's practice to have to try and forge these paths and, and these endeavors. And uh, you know, the idea of writing, making purely formalistic work, um, you know, that's, that's just in, invested in aesthetic or form or whatever, it's quite um, enticing and freeing, but also doesn't seem to be available to me at least. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so now I'm thinking about art writing and how nice it would have been to just come up with that as a way of finding a space between the textual and the visual. Uh, and free from politics. And so I guess it's this question of, you know, uh, a burden. Do you feel a burden of a weight of politics and, and could you be free from it or would you want to be? I throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess my experience like in the indigenous arts community, um, you know, when we, when we do have that moment of, of exhibition, um, I just think about some of the, the works that I've been able to uh, witness in open space and, and the legacy gallery and when indigenous artists come together and are held in that space, I, I feel that gratitude. I feel that um, sense of um, there's that moment where the gallery is for the criticism, for the critical. Mm -hmm. And what it usually is advocating for is for indigenous voices to be heard and for that alternative narrative to come forward. And so in terms of that burden, you know, we hear that sometimes in our communities where we don't want to be the one teaching all of the time. We don't want to be the one, you know, to be singled out because we're the only indigenous person in the room or in the class. And that was also challenged when um, this woman from New Zealand came. Um, she was doing some courses up at Camosun, and Ruth Lyle had introduced me to her. And she was talking about, you know, uh, indigenous uh, theater practices and um, implementing those into larger institutions and, and working with larger theater companies. And uh, I said, you never feel that burden of being the educator of Maori uh, worldview? And she said, no, never. She said, that's my position of authority and I'm going to take it, you know. And it just really challenged that word burden to like, to to that position of authority that it's it's all also a joy for me to express song and dance and to talk about my culture and even in this new role at UVic you know they're like well you know it's like it, they, they they talk about tokenism and this token role and I, and although maybe some people might think that you know but at the same time when you're a native person and you are who you are and you sing these songs and you share this knowledge because it's who you are and, and you love it and it gives you life and it, and it makes you feel like you're, you're contributing in a good way. You can never feel tokenism from that position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, uh, it, it's freedom. And, and I see the elders do it, like May Sam and, you know, she just goes and she shares her songs and she gets asked all over campus and outside of campus to, to be the indigenous voice of, of, of prayer and blessing and 
when when I talk to her and I'm like, you're so busy, she says, I love doing it. I love doing it. It makes me feel happy. Mm. So I think that that perception of burden, I think, has been a narrative um, and it has been executed in different ways where people have felt singled out and that pressure of knowing. Mm. But I also, that woman also challenged that narrative for me living here in Canada about be, feeling like a burden to feeling like I have knowledge to share how grateful I am that I'm not in a position of not knowing which community I'm from, some knowledge that I know. I know how to sing my songs. I know how to do my dances. I know what our medicines are for. I have knowledge, you know, and that's my position of power and authority that nobody can take from me, mm. too. Mm. Yeah, so I've kind of challenged that word burden for myself a mm. little bit through, through just being influenced that way. Yeah, and that's that's I have very similar thoughts around challenging the word burden and I think that I think there's some it's not like if I'm passive to it, I think the burden can be placed upon me. Mm -hmm. So when I think about my writing versus visual art, my writing ha at times like through poems and, and various things, it it does feel like I I took on that burden and very much and I think part of that if I'm going to be really self-critical is that I can't make those beautiful sentences that I was talking about earlier. I'm not at that level. And so I feel like I want to. I want to get there, and I hope I will. But I think that it's almost a bit, in my, in my experience, been almost like a cop-out on my part to be like, OK, I'll take on this burden, because then I can write about this pain that I have felt in various ways. But in my visual art, I don't tend to do that. And I, I wonder, this is you know my own theory about myself, is because I've, I've done visual art much longer, and I have more more skills to draw from and I it, it feels more powerful and so I don't choose to tap into a place of burden or pain to get there although it's not something I share as publicly because yeah and, and so I, I think also around the, the burden piece like it's we have some agency around it and we can think a bit more about it it's it's I think it can it's almost like nowadays you can really commercialize that pain and and that really doesn't sit well with me. And so part of the, that is why I've stepped back from some of my writing and to tell myself, like, maybe I need to work on the practice of writing and word crafting more so that I don't have to rely. I don't want to fall prey to that, to, to take on this burden, because there is a hungry audience for it. I can feel it. If I want to really, like, talk about all of the racism, sex, whatever ism, things that I've experienced and I write about it, that I can probably make make a good go of it. But that's not what I what I want. And so, you know, I think about um, in Victoria, sometimes I go to, like, the Moss Street Art Walk or just various places. There's this, like, West Coast art style of, like, Arbutus trees and, like, wide open skies that feels very unburdened. And it's usually people, not always, but oftentimes people who are retired. I'm like, can I do that when I'm retired? Like, I'm very far <laughs> from retirement. But I'm like, maybe one day when I'm retired, I can make unburdened art where I can just be inspired by my like cottage on the water that I'm never going to have. Um, and, and you know, I, I wonder about that. Like, that seems like very unburdened art, but is it is it interesting? Mm. So I wrestle with that. I don't know. Maybe in, like, 40, 50 years, you'll find me with a booth on the, on the street. <laughs> and you'll be like, when? Uh, like, well, you're unburdened. You've yeah. finally been unburdened. <laughs> is that making it, you know, to, to be living yeah. on my pension? No. It makes yeah. me feel very much that I want to carry a burden very much. So, <laughs> okay. Um, yes. So I thank those of you that have said kind words about Brown Color. I think that's been profound for me, I really appreciate it. Primary uh, hyphen color dot CA. Um, and one of the things that's been mentioned that we, the, the methodologies that we use is the five R's. And I just want to take a moment to, to talk about them because they just came up one after another there. Um, Lindsay talking about the idea of turning the burden on its head. Um, and you did as well, Sally, that it's, it's our responsibility, it's not a burden, it's our responsibility mm -hmm. to speak from our subjectivities and our, you know, positionalities about the lives we lead. So I don't see it as a burden at all. It's responsibility, one of the five R's. Mm -hmm. And Rance talked, uh, or sorry, um, Nicole talked about uh, the idea of being relevant. That's one of the five R's, relevant, mm -hmm. really important. You spoke a minute ago about gratitude which is related to the concept of reciprocity. Mm -hmm. So that when we take, we give, we give, we take. Mm -hmm. 
And rats, what did you say? Sorry, getting old. Care. Care. Uh, care. You, know, you talked about um, actually riffing off what Lindsay said about um, the conscious contract. And that, that concept is the concept of relationality, mm -hmm. of being uh, in relation with others. So that if you're in relation with others, you have to take care. It just comes with the purpose. Mm -hmm. And the other fifth one is the concept of respect, which people have been trying to utilize today. But around the question of arts criticism, which is why we're here today, presumably, I think when systems are in crises, and many of the systems we live under are in crisis, Planets in crisis, capitalism is in crisis, patriarchy is in crisis, homophobia is in crisis, and specifically the art system is very much in crisis. That's why we're having this conversation. Mm -hmm. There's two ways of dealing with crisis historically that people have used. One is to take the meta narrative and pluralize it. So if we're going to talk about arts criticism, the first thing we have to do is talk about arts, not art. Art, and acknowledge that we're talking about Bangra and powwow dancing and Typo drumming and that the art forms that are leading, the art forms that exist on this territory that we now call Canada. We're not talking about a Western definition of art. So that's number one, we're talking about arts. Secondly, by using the word criticisms and pluralizing it, we're talking about different traditions and how different traditions formulate the meaning and historical context for what art creation is. In indigenous communities, uh, art practice is not the same as it is in the gallery system. It's not the same in Punjabi tr traditions. It's just not the same. It's a real huge challenge for those of us who live in this territory called Canada because we have to become literate and legible in many, many traditions before we can make sense even of what's going on. So that's one response to crises. To, to get rid of the meta narrative, you talked about that in terms of patriarchy. To get rid of the meta narrative and replace. I don't want to live in a world where we replace one center by another center. I want to live in a world where there's no center and where we pluralize Canadian cultures and Canadian art practice. The other um, methodology to deal with crisis is to throw words out. And that's been said by a couple of people that criticism is a capitalist concept. I'm not sure that's right, but let's say for a minute it is. It's certainly a competitive kind of word, so that relates to capitalism. And maybe as you suggested a few minutes ago, the, the word, there's two ways of understanding it. One is to say that Criticism is a kind of commentary, or to use your word, reflection. It's a kind of way of commenting, and there are many, many examples, you raised a couple of them, uh, where people are trying to write in that way and think in that way. Particularly, I think of Richard Hill, for example, who talks about indigenous criticism as being an amalgam of different kinds of criticism. We saw a beautiful film the other day, Frost Night, about Toni Morrison called The Pieces I Am, which constructs the various streams uh, and experiences that go into making her who she is as, a, as an African-American person, as a writer, as a woman, and so on. So that's one way of looking at it and say, okay, we're not criticizing, we're commenting, we're reflecting, we're observing, we're noticing. And another way to take it to the meta level is to talk about discourse. And that's what I feel is really missing in Canada. We're extremely lacking in the idea of discourse or discursive, what Frost would choose a lot, is framing discursive framing. How are we going to talk about art from different traditions, about different subjectivities, mm. without changing the frame? Mm. And to develop a critical discourse around art practices, or arts practices, to use my own framing there, um, will, will require a level, a meta level of work that we're just beginning to do. We're just beginning to do that in this country. Mm -hmm. We have come to the point where we understand the critique around the Western world that this is no longer, it doesn't hold anymore. It doesn't probably hold for anybody in this room in a patriarchal way of understanding our practice. But just talking about diversity or multiculturalism or how we, you know, isn't it great we live in Canada? It, it's not good enough. It's clearly not good enough. So I'll end my little speech here, my little rant, with encouraging you to become more literate in contexts that you don't know and you don't understand. Because that's what we're going to need going forward. And there's a lot of millennials in this room who I have a lot of faith in. And that's something that we all need to do collectively together. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to just mouth the platitudes of, of multiculturalism and, you know, look at, isn't this really a diverse room and all that. We need to become literate in, in the different ways of seeing the different worldviews that exist on this territory. Thank you. <coughs>
Thank you. I, Do you want to respond? I, I just want to say one thing to, to add on to that, and it's about um, the disruption of understanding our worldview. And I think that's the first part of business is in order to be able to look and um, come together and to view art in, in different contexts, like you're saying. I need to understand my Iroquois worldview first, you know, and I think that's the responsibility aspect of each and every one of us uh, to be able to share from that place of knowing and going back into those ways of, of seeing the world through that lens and really feeling confident in that. So I just wanted to add that to your beautiful speech. <laughs> Do you want to add anything? Oh, yes, question? Yes, can I comment? Yes. I just like listening to like talk about like relationship and like the relationship of like the artist and then the audience relationship and responsibility to that too. And just in terms of like where the like the conversation starting with like what could like integrate having like a publication or something like that. But I was just, I was just thinking about like, is there a way to like, write down this like learning of relationship, like the artist and somebody writing or um, two artists talking, like a way to like write it down as an invitation for other people to like then enter relationship in their own communities as they're trying mm -hmm. to do this. So if it's like, if it's, you know, if it's a question of like documenting, like I was just thinking, yeah, like this way to like model, like, be building relationship while modeling building relationship as like a form of criticism or that kind of thing. Like, mm -hmm. So yeah, just kind of and and I was thinking about care too, and I think this comes into it too. Like I was thinking about how I take my five year old to go see art and the care that I the way that I explain art to her and the way that I talk about it and the way that I like build her understanding of the world by like looking at other people's understanding of the mm -hmm. world and the way that when I don't understand something we look it up together we're like oh this person's from here what does this mean and so and I think that that is a really it's a picture of care like in something mm -hmm. that I need to extend when she's not there as well mm -hmm. thank you um, <coughs> anyone else any other comments Okay, um, I think we'll we'll wrap it up with one final kind of. Did you have? Was that a hand? Was there a hand? <laughs> okay, we, we'll. So when, while we've been, uh, so we'll, we'll sort of wrap it up. But then there's more time. There's snacks, and there's there's more time for discussion. Absolutely, if you don't sort of want to speak within the circle, that's absolutely fine. Um, so we while we've been meeting and discussing and planning this event, we had talk about. Um, various books, podcasts, et cetera, that we've found um, informative and in sort of shaping our th thinking and our ideas around this. Um, so would you like to share a book <laughs> recommendation before we depart into sort of smaller groups and mingle? Mm. Serena. <laughs> yes, um, mine actually is, it's listed on the list, but I just wanted to really highlight it. It's an essay by my friend Vivek Shreya uh, called uh, How Did the Suffering of Marginalized Artists Become So Marketable? Um, yeah, and it was an essay in um, Now Toronto magazine. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really just her investigating, like, her own, you know, uh, creative practice and how so much of her writing has been formed around her identity and around the struggles that she's experienced as a trans woman of color. Um, and uh, it's tied in with a, uh, a, a photo series that she did called Trauma Clown, uh, thinking about, like, the idea of the clown and um, how there was some theory that she was referring to, and I can't remember the author of it, but how a clown is someone who does something so repetitively that it becomes funny or kind of tragic um, in its own way. And uh, how does that apply to, I guess, marginalized artists? And how do we just expect marginalized artists to continually dredge up more and more of their own traumas, uh, as opposed to, you know, allowing marginalized artists to express whatever they want and to tell the stories that they want to tell? Why are we continually tokenizing and expecting marginalized artists to um, just tell their own stories of their traumas and their oppressions? Um, I think it's really, really important to, yeah, for us to reflect on, you know, the fact that, yeah, so many, so many marginalized artists are still, you know, limited in what they can, stories they can tell and what stories they can really market. 
Yeah, and I, I'm trying to think of like other places where we talk about that kind of conversation, and there, those conversations are happening, but I, I'm still searching for other places where we can talk about that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And did you, Lindsay's passing on this question. Lindsay's passing on this question. And uh, my, my, um, my recommendation, uh, which I recommended to everyone all last year, because it just really blew my mind, was Heartberries by Therese Mayette, uh, which is a memoir. Although when I started reading it, I thought it was a novel. And um, she is from, is it Seabird Island Reserve? Is that right? Um, and it just, it, it, you know, the, the subject of the book is uh, revisiting childhood sexual abuse, um, mental illness, uh, raising her son, forging a new relationship. But it, the reason it blew my mind is because it looked, you know, you're holding it in your hand, and I think I read it over the course of a weekend, and it looks by all intents and purposes like a memoir or like a novel, but it's as if, it's as if she met, her writing is so phenomenal that it's as if she somehow has gotten within the canonical form, and it's like literally exploding in your hands in, in the most masterly writing that I've ever encountered. So it's as if it feels like it's shaking when you read it, because you, read, you finish it and you're like, whoa, that, that's what it means to decolonize a, a memoir or decolonize a novel. She's within the form, but exploding the form while she's within it. Um, so that, that was my um, cool. recommendation onto the list. Uh, Sally? Yeah, I um, I read that piece by Vivek. Every, everything by her is great. Okay. So I, I would yeah. just say like <laughs> everything she's ever written is my recommendation. <laughs> but it reminds me t uh, two or so years ago I was in the I was at the Vancouver Queer Film Festival and um, she was doing like an artist talk about mm -hmm. like all the things I've done. And at one point she was like, you know, I wish I could just write a poem about a lawnmower. Yeah. Were you there? Uh, no, but I can, Im I can imagine. Okay. Maybe, maybe yeah, she said I, this I, multiple times. Sure yeah. yeah, she was like, you know, I read another poem and somebody was just writing about a lawnmower and I was yeah. like, yeah, you know, lawnmowers are really inspiring. Yeah. But she was like, I can't because people expect me to write about like trans issues or about this or that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's, it's really important to think about. Um, I also gave a bunch of recommendations on the reading list, but for me, actually, I've been trying not to listen or read very much lately. Um, in the summer, I really tried to get outside, and so last weekend, I guess it was, I went <coughs> on a solo bike camping trip mm. by myself. It was my first time. It was a, a big challenge, but I went, and I actually had a bunch of podcast downloaded and I do have a lot that I constantly listen to but I forgot my charger for the external battery and so I was like oh I actually can't use my phone at all because I now need it tomorrow to get in contact so I was like it's going to be a weekend of silence mm -hmm. and the book that I brought was called The Pursuit of Silence which is a book that uh, I forget the who wrote it David something um, but it, they also made a documentary which I saw first a few years ago and it was really good and then I bought this book and I was like I'm going to read about the pursuit of silence and then life got really hectic and noisy and I never finished it. So I brought it to Saturna Island and I listened to nature. I watched the, the water for like an hour and a half. It was, <laughs> I, was, I think I just zoned out and just watched it, read a bit of this book and just listened to myself essentially. Then be a beautiful line to end on, <laughs> I think. We'll listen to yourself um, or listen to ourselves. Okay, so. Mm. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, thinking of Brown Magazine, coming back to the idea of art criticism mm -hmm. with the criticism of mm -hmm. records. Uh, Brown Magazine um, is a magazine trying to do a little bit of what we're talking about, mm -hmm. um, talking about the art of artists of color and indigenous artists mm -hmm. in a different way, different approaches. Um, so I highly recommend you to have a look. And then I'm thinking of two indigenous authors. Uh, just mentioned Richard Hill. Um, his stuff is available online. He writes nicely about indigenous art. Um, and the other author is David Cardinal. But I, I think if you haven't read him, um, again, you can find stuff online. Uh, these are, are two people that do, I think, try to come at art criticism from a different perspective. What was the name of the magazine? Run. R -E Run. Oh, okay. H, yeah. Okay, cool. thanks. Based in South Asian community. Oh, wow, cool. Are you actually wrong is the Gujarati word for color? Right. Wrong means color. Cool. Thank you. Uh, any other book recommendations? <laughs> <laughs> we all love a book club. Everyone loves a book club. Okay, um, book club is my favorite part of the month. All right. So, um, okay, so first of all, thank you to all of you for being here and spending your sunny Sunday afternoon with us. 
Um, thank you for all of your insightful comments from the floor and for your support. And to an amazing panel of speakers, thank you for sharing your time both today and in preparation. Um, I feel like I've had my own um, lenses and biases kind of revealed and revealed and revealed and interrogated through our conversations. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to you for that and look forward to more conversation. Um, and, uh, and thank you to Ranson Reagan for all of your organization. And so uh, on the note of more conversation, there are snacks. And there is a survey. And um, if you just join me in thanking our speakers.